Good morning, church. Welcome to worship at Church of Our Savior. It is good to have you here today. I'm Pastor Wendy Worthrock. I'm a retired pastor from the Greater Milwaukee Synod, um, living in Sheboygan, though, and I am familiar with this synod. In fact, I was just telling someone this morning that exactly 20 years ago, I was a short-term interim at your sister church, Emmanuel Trinity, when it was still located at its old downtown location. So I, uh, I have memories of uh, serving in Fond du Lac, and I'm pretty sure I was in this church at least once or twice when I was uh, at IT at that time. We uh, begin our service today with the order of confession and forgiveness as it is found in your bulletin. Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, forgive us that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.
the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Lord God, your loving kindness always goes before us and follows after us. Summon us into your light and direct our steps in the ways of goodness that come through the cross of your Son. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading comes to us from Isaiah 9, 1 through 4. There will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, the Lord brought into contempt the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. 
You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exalt when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and a bar cross their shoulders. The rod of the oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, one thing I ask to see, that I may have my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to see God in the temple. For in the day of trouble, God will give me shelter. Hidden places of the sanctuary and raise me high up on a rock. Therefore, I will offer sacrifice in the sanctuary, sacrifices of rejoicing, and sing and make music. on me and answer me. My heart speaks your message, seek my face. Your face, O oh Lord, I will seek. Hide not your face from me, turn not away from your servant in anger. Cast me not away, you have been my helper. Forsake me not, O God, my salvation. The second reading comes to us from 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 18. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother Don, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately that they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, we're going to begin today with a little fill in the blank. So when I do this, you have to fill in the blank, okay? Follow me, and I will make you... Or fish for people. Yep, you got different translations, but you got it. Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. There's the Bible answer. Jesus called his first disciples by saying, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. But what did fishing for people mean to those four men? I mean, Jesus didn't explain that promise. I suppose it may not have meant anything to them. Maybe Jesus' presence was so compelling that he could have asked them to root for the Minnesota Vikings and still they would have left everything to follow him. Jesus could do the impossible, you know. Matthew's Gospel does, after all, stress Jesus' divinely given authority. Jesus calls people here in this story in the way that God had called prophets like Elijah and Elisha. So, these four may have just heard God calling through Jesus. And yet, they also may have heard something else. They may have heard a military call-up. You see, in the ancient world, fishing was a metaphor for judgment of one's enemies. The Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament, tell stories of Israel's enemies conquering the country and then deporting Israelites by attaching a piece of rope to a large hook and then sticking the hook's business end through people's lower lips. And then they tied the roof's loose end to the back of a wagon and forced their captives to walk into exile. If the captives couldn't keep up, Oh, we can imagine what happened. These 
Old Testament accounts of Israel's conquerors fishing for people recalled Israel's trauma and humiliation at the hands of its enemies. So when Jesus used that phrase, it wouldn't be unlikely that these disciples may have heard it was payback time. Israel then, after all, had been living under Rome's brutal thumb for decades. Revolution was a common topic in the country. So maybe God's Messiah finally had come to lead a revolt to free Israel from the darkness of oppression. Now they would be inserting the hooks. But if the disciples heard that, in Jesus' promise, they soon learned otherwise. Jesus did continue through Galilee, teaching and preaching that God's rule had dawned, but instead of rallying people to march on Jerusalem, he followed his words with acts of healing. Jesus healed people's bodies, minds, and spirits. And he healed not only faithful Jews, but also lapsed Jews, and even the many non-Jews who lived in Galilee. Across religious and cultural divides, Jesus fished for people through words and deeds of mercy. And people swarmed to him from everywhere. If the disciples hadn't yet gotten the point, Jesus then expanded on it for three years. He kept on healing people. But he also accepted rejected people, like tax collectors. He accepted hated outsiders like Roman soldiers and nobodies like women and children. Jesus also forgave people's sins and showed generosity to poor people. He even taught his followers not to retaliate against their enemies, but to love them instead. And when he himself was arrested, he refused to fight back. And when he rose from the dead after his unjust execution, he did not return to exact revenge. Again, he offered mercy. The great epiphany of Jesus' life is that people are gathered into God's kingdom not through fear, revenge, or coercion, but through mercy. That's amazingly good news, isn't it? Even if we've heard it before. The good news that Jesus gathers people into God's kingdom through mercy especially is marvelous to hear in these dark times. When I recalled Israel's invaders carrying them into exile by cruel means, I couldn't help thinking of Russia's army kidnapping Ukraine's children and taking them to Russia in hopes of crushing Ukraine by turning their children into Russians. And I thought about fishing for people as a violent political act against one's enemies. I was reminded of the defeated Republican candidate in Arizona arrested this past week for hiring men to assassinate four Democrats. Jesus, merciful, nonviolent fishing for all people, including foreigners, seems downright astonishing, doesn't it? In a time when some want to kick immigrants out of America? In these times when some urge us to hate gay and trans people, Jesus' acceptance of rejected people is astonishing, isn't it? When we're encouraged to lock and load to take out our so-called enemies, Jesus' non-retaliation and love for enemies is astonishing, isn't it? These days, the news of Jesus gathering all people into God's embrace through mercy is like a comet suddenly flashing across the night sky. It is that surprising and that astonishingly beautiful. And yet, Jesus' indiscriminate mercy also is astonishingly dangerous. 
Jesus' disciples may have been dazzled at first by God's reign arriving through Jesus' mercy, but they soon saw how Jesus' practice of mercy upset the status quo, which was built on fear, hatred, division, and violence. Israel's religious leadership didn't like Jesus attacking their power or their exclusionist teaching of Israel's faith. How do you run a decent religion if you don't look down on outsiders? How do you keep insiders in line if you don't crack the spiritual or actual whip? Even if the world they oversaw was crooked, they were in charge. And who was Jesus to tell them otherwise? They hated him, just like their ancestors hated the other prophets God had sent. Jesus, after all, didn't want to keep people numb and passive through a little charity here and there. He wanted them to live in a world that was just and therefore peaceful and fruitful. But such a world would mean wholesale change for both leaders and people. It would mean facing the truth that they had not been working on God's behalf. It would mean repentance, and they couldn't have that. So they collaborated with the Romans to crucify Jesus, to kill him, yes, but also to discredit him as a heretic. Because the Bible says that the man executed on a tree is a heretic damned by God. Jesus' mission of gathering people into God's kingdom through mercy got him killed. And it got Peter, Andrew, and James killed, and John exiled to Patmos. It got a lot of other early disciples killed because a world ruled by God's mercy meant overturning the world as it was. So the powers that be, religious, economic, and political, fought that merciful reign. The powers that be, political, economic, and yes, religious, still fight God's merciful reign. America just observed a day of remembrance for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Reverend King literally gave his life working to establish God's beloved community built on mercy for all. Like Jesus King understood that for God's mercy to rule the world's crookedness, its racism, its economic inequality, and its political imbalances, all of that crookedness would have to be exposed so that it could be changed. So he gathered people to march nonviolently for voting rights and fair housing, fair wages, and an end to war. His nonviolent marches exposed crookedness among us. When those unarmed people were beaten, arrested, and murdered. King himself was assassinated in 1968. Because fishing for people through mercy exposes the world's crookedness. Jesus' call was dangerous 2,000 years ago, and it still is. Which is why the church, sadly, over the centuries, has often turned away from following her Lord while still thinking she follows him. That turning away already was happening in Paul's time. In today's reading, Paul urges the Corinthian church to mend the divisions among them by turning again to follow Jesus, who died and rose to show mercy to all. You see, the more powerful among that church had begun mistreating the poor among them. So Paul called them back to the God of mercy, revealed so brilliantly in Jesus. Sadly, the church again turned away when it allied itself with Emperor Constantine in the 4th century, and again when it joined forces with other emperors, kings, and dictators, including in Germany, Hitler, and now in the Russian Orthodox Church with Putin. 
Today, parts of the American church have chosen white supremacy over God's rule of mercy. Other parts of the American church have just lost their nerve. Afraid of religious and political bullies, they try to stay alive by staying silent. But when the church gives up on God's radiant rule of mercy, we end up sitting in the shadow of death. One writer put it this way, if the light bearers insist on darkness, darkness they shall have. If the peace people insist on war, war they shall have. If the people called to bring God's love and forgiveness into the world insist on hating everyone else, hatred and all that it brings will come crashing around their heads. Neither joining the bullies nor tiptoeing around them yields God's radiant life abundant. So in these dark times, the church has a choice to make. Despite the real risks, will we follow Jesus and fish for people through teaching, preaching, and showing mercy to all? Will we offer charity, but also work for God's healing justice? Will we repent? That is, will we examine our attitudes and actions, our commitments and our lack of commitment, and ask God to change us? The good news is that we can. We can repent and follow by the mercy that Jesus offers us along with everyone else. If we think that we can't possibly follow like those first superstar disciples, well, here's the good news. We can. Because for starters, they weren't superstars. They turned away often. They deserted Jesus at the cross. They resisted letting Gentiles into the church without first becoming Jews. They were not superstars. They just said yes by God's grace. And then God's gracious mercy repeatedly turned them around, led them on, and made a way for them where there was no way. God made a way for Peter, who denied Jesus, but eventually died for him. God made a way for Paul, who persecuted Jesus' church, but eventually died for Jesus' church. If God can make them fishers who practice Jesus' mercy, God's Spirit can make us such disciples. God's Spirit can lift us even up like Reverend King to follow Jesus even into the valley of the shadow of death and discover there the shepherd's light of resurrection burning brightly. The Spirit who raised Jesus can turn both a rebellious church and a scared church into a merciful church that offers God's mercy in this world. Even now, despite our many flaws, Jesus' spirit works through the church. When the ELC World Hunger Appeal and local groups like Love Incorporated feed poor people, the church is responding to Jesus' call to mercy. When Lutheran World Relief and Lutheran Disaster Response assist people experiencing disasters, the church is responding to Jesus' call to mercy. When Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services, in partnership with local congregations, resettle immigrants and refugees, we are responding to Jesus' call to mercy. When church advocates for gun safety and the compassionate treatment of desperate women seeking abortions, we are responding to God's call to mercy. When the church defends the lives of black and brown people and LGBTQ people for those who would harm them, the church is responding to Jesus' call to mercy. 
When the church calls for an end to policy that worsen inequality and destroy the earth, we respond to Jesus' call to mercy. And when the church calls for an end to the politics of revenge, we are responding to Jesus' call for mercy. Jesus' spirit already works through some in the church. But in these dark times, Jesus calls the whole church to renew our commitment to practicing God's mercy for all. This is the truth. Jesus' call to fish for people through mercy is dangerous because it summons us into a new creation that sets right this crooked one. But that new creation is worth the risk because it is God's radiant life. And really, what have we to fear? Like the morning star, our Lord of mercy is risen from the dead and his rising guarantees that God's rule of mercy will prevail over all other powers. The Lord who is our light and salvation is calling us. By his grace, may we repent and follow him in fishing for people with God's brilliant mercy. Let be so for you. Amen. We stand for our hymn.
We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Make your church one in purpose, proclaiming the message of the cross. Help us to work together across differences. Energize ecumenical partnerships, including the World Council of Churches and Lutheran World Federation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We rejoice at the bounty of your creation. Fill the land and sea with your abundance. Bless harvests in the southern hemisphere and fallow fields in the northern hemisphere. Equip farmers to till and keep the earth sustainably. Merciful God, hear our prayer. In Christ, your reign comes near and calls all to repentance. Break the rod of the oppressor in every nation. Dispel the shadow of death in places of war and persecution. Grant us leaders who lift the yokes that burden those in need. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Be a stronghold for those in trouble and a rock for all who are afraid. Rouse communities to care for neighbors who need shelter, are facing maltreatment, or are isolated and lonely. We especially pray for healing and comfort for those on the prayer list. We pray for the students and their families who were involved in yesterday's car accident in town. Merciful God, sustain the ministries of this congregation and all churches in this community. Nurture each congregation's unique witness to your presence. Foster mutual respect. Inspire our cooperation in loving our neighbors. Merciful God, We praise you for the faithful you who have gone ahead of us, both famous and unknown. Help us to leave our nets and follow, and bring us with them to the fullness of your promise of eternal life. Merciful God, we bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. We share the peace with one another. Peace be with you.
you do this part, I do that part. Let us pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Be holy, 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 which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Come and taste the joy of God. I understand that you will be coming forward uh, by forming one line down the center, receiving bread from me and then wine uh, from one of the servers, and then uh, returning to the pews uh, by the side aisles. And there is um, wine as well as grape juice in the center ring of the trays. Come, for all is ready and all are welcome.
Please stand. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Holy One, we thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, love kindness, and journey humbly with you. Amen. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist us in this ministry on which we are sent forth. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those to whom we bring the sacrament, that through the body and blood of your Son, we all, may all know the comfort of your abiding presence. Amen. Amen. The God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod, bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Follow the lead of Jesus. Thanks be to God. God.